هذا نول بانا اوف النكو تيوثا So, as we mentioned in the previous lesson, the Palestinian vocalization system seems to be the best fit for Galilean Aramaic. Conveniently, we do have a number of Galilean manuscripts with Palestinian vowels. Most of these manuscripts are piyutim, Hebrew for poems. Now, the earliest Palestinian vowel system had five vowel symbols that represent six distinct sounds. However, since the five vowel sounds have no traditional names, we're going to have to give them names to keep them straight. But a quick and very serious disclaimer first. I want to do my best to teach Galilean classically. This means that I want to avoid coining or borrowing words as much as possible. If I were to do that too much, I would cease to be teaching Galilean Aramaic and begin teaching some kind of Neo-Galilean. For I wish to see Galilean revived, and this kind of change is essential if it is to be revived, As they say, the, the name for language that isn't changing and evolving is dead. I want to let the process of growth happen on its own among speakers. So, sticking to as many classical terms is, at this juncture, essential to form a foundation for this language to thrive upon. That said, these vowel signs still need names. We just can't call them a, e, i, o, u. So I'm going to make an exception to my general rule, and we're going to try and use known terms when they're available, and other contemporary terms when they are not. So, vowel names. The first is pathach, which as we discussed earlier means open. It represents an open A vowel, A. This name was easy to choose, as it does survive in, albeit late, Galilean. This vowel we will call tsre, which means cracked open, specifically one's teeth. It represents an E sound, E. This vowel we will call hrik, which means clenched teeth or clenching. It represents an I sound, E. This vowel we will call komats, which means closed fist or rounded. It's the cognate to kamats. It represents an O sound, O. Finally, we will call this vowel kfuts, which means contracted, as in the lips. It represents a U sound, U. Here they all are side by side. Pathach, tsre, khrik, komats, kfuts. A, E, I, O, U. Positioning. Originally, each of these vowels was pronounced after the letter that it was placed upon. So, if we were to replace the alafs in our example with baiths, we would get ba, be, bi, bo, bu. With gamal, we would get ga, ke, gi, go, gu, etc. These would also be written on the letter before an alaf, wa, or yod to indicate the quality of vowel they represent. For example, these would be pronounced be, bi, bo, bu. However, in Galilean Aramaic texts, more so than Hebrew, because alaf, wa, and yod were very seldom written without a representing vowel, some scribes would write the vowel markings on top of them instead. For example, these would also be pronounced be, B, bo, bu. In Kathav Malay, full writing, for the most part you won't see tsre or khrik without yod, or komats and kafuts without wa in some manner. Because of this kind of pairing, tsre was adopted to represent shua when it was written without a yod following it. For example, mum versus mem versus mim. Initial sounds. Initial vowel rather than consonant sounds were indicated by alaf. A, a, e, i, o, u. If a word starts with a yod, it was doubled if the first vowel was tsle or khrik. Y, ya, ye, yi, yo, yu. 
Sometimes, albeit rarely, you may see Ya represented with Yod Alaf. Also rarely, if a word started with a wall, it was doubled. W, wa, we, we. However, only four or five such words are known. Much more commonly, when a word begins with a wall, it is the particle w, which means and. In these cases, it isn't written doubled. Diphthongs. Diphthongs were indicated by vowels falling before double yod and double wa. And the doublets could take on vowels of their very own, like any other consonant. Mayin, yon, awer. Final he. Also, in the spirit of y among English vowels, we all know the saying a e i o u sometimes y. In Galilean, it's alaf wa yod and sometimes he. With only a few exceptions, like abba or father, or with some suffixes, when pethach comes at the end of a word, it is followed by he. This is something to remember, as most other Aramaic dialects like to use alaf for that instead. Mela, duva. It tends to cause a bit of confusion for those who aren't expecting it. Stolen pethach. Finally, one last rare quirk when it comes to vowels. When pethach is written upon the last letter of a word, it is pronounced before it. This is known as pethach geniv, or a stolen pethach. In truth, it's merely a convenience to avoid clashing vowel markings on words such as noach or ruach, as two vowel points can't fit upon one letter. That just about wraps up the basics of early Palestinian vocalization. Application to Galilean So, what are the modifications we were talking about earlier? Well, since all of these rules were never standardized, and different options were often used within the same text, all we're going to do differently is to commit to a few standards. 1. Tzre and Chirik will always fall on Yod. 2. Komats and Kafuts will always fall on Wal. Three, tsre on its own or on initial yod always represents schwa. Four, yod kafila and wal kafila are written with one vowel only, as if they are letters of their own. With these four rules, we should have some consistency in our learning. Simply remember that in actual Galilean texts, things would be a bit more shaken up. Next steps. As this is a lot to take in all at once, uh, at this time, if you haven't already, watch this video again from the beginning. Let it sink in, and over the course of the next few lessons, these spelling conventions will become second nature. On the website, there will also be a full set of supplemental materials that you can use to go over sight reading and writing, so I strongly recommend that you check out the links in the description for those. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them off at the AramaicNT.org forum. Until next time. <laughs>